Um, thanks so much, Catherine and Ingrid, and to everybody for um, being here today. I think one of the lovely things about being a paediatrician is that we're very casual, as you can see. So um, if you don't want to wear a suit, come be one of us. Um, so as a paediatrician, um, I come from a place where we celebrate the fact that in Australia, most children are healthy. We're very lucky. But they also face many issues. And, and this is work that was done by one of our medical students about three years ago, where she looked within the longitudinal study of Australian children. So this is data on our children um, right across Australia. And she found that parents at every age, from two years right up to 15 years, um, more than 60% of them said that their child had at least one ongoing problem at any given time. And from eight years, that went up to at least 70% at every age, eight, 10, 12, 14. And what that translates into is enormous numbers of kids. We're quite a small nation. We don't have that many kids, and yet we have more than half a million kids with mental health problems. Nearly three quarters of a million with allergies, eczema, asthma nearly a quarter of a million with obesity or serious obesity and that's not counting the many many hundreds of thousands of children who are overweight and on it goes in developmental and psychosocial issues and I think that one of the really sobering things is that when I was a medical student in the 80s when I was doing my pediatric training in the early 90s we were dealing with all of these issues then and since then there's been another 30 years of research and intensive efforts and what's happened to all of these conditions is that they've got worse. And so what that says to us is that our research, among other things, research can't solve everything, but certainly our research isn't keeping pace. And that has led us to think, well, how can we change the way we do research so that we can actually address these issues faster and better and get them into practice quicker. So our fundamental question um, in the work that um, my team does and indeed the whole Murdoch Children Research Institute does is how can we keep children as individuals and as populations healthy and developing well across the life course and that pretty much sums up life as a clinician scientist because as a clinician we're looking after individuals and as population researchers we're looking after populations. And so that really brings that nexus um, together. So in terms of life for me as a clinician scientist and possibly life for you as a clinician scientist, well, what can you expect? Well, you'll have three lives. You'll be a clinician. You'll be a researcher. And you'll be an individual um, with your own family or your own interests um, outside. Um, otherwise, you won't be a healthy person. Um, and so from where you sit, I would imagine that, that your path, I hope your path forward looks beautiful like this, but it probably doesn't look um, very clear. And you know, you, you'll need to start making, without yet knowing what that clarity is, you'll need to start making some choices. Um, so the sorts of choices that I had to make um, in, in the 90s, beginning of the 90s when I was thinking about research was, well, I want to have kids. That means I probably can't do my first loves, neonates, endocrine, um, neurology. I don't want to work nights. I haven't got a family to help look after my kids. So I'm going to do developmental behavioral pediatrics where not much happens between midnight and 8 a.m. Pardon? <laughs> um, and, and I also, um, because I didn't have family here, um, I also needed some pragmatic choices about if I was going to be a researcher and going to try and make it work, how was I actually going to build my international collaborations? So I had some parents-in-law in Auckland, so I just decided, okay, once a year I'm going to go to America, I'm going to drop my kids in Auckland, I'm going to go to the same conference every year, and I'm going to build those relationships over the next 20 years, and I'll go to Europe later on. Um, and, and that worked very well for me, but you have to kind of start making those pragmatic choices um, very early. And you'll find that your research life, your clinical life, and your um, <clears throat> family life collide, if you're like me. You'll press gang your children to be guinea pigs for every study that you do. And when your children grow up to become medical students, they'll find themselves as being your research assistants. 
There we are. <laughs> and so will their unfortunate boyfriends. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll find that clinicians and scientists, people who do one or the other, they, they'll, they'll both envy you because you have something that they don't have. You have a bigger purpose. You always have a fallback position if your research world isn't going well or if your clinical world um, isn't going well. And you have access to a whole lot of things that they don't have. And one of the very special things that you have access to is being able to talk to families and being able to talk to other clinicians. And it completely changes the way that you address problems because you know what families are thinking. You will find, of course, that you envy them. Um, because they're only doing one job. They shut up their epic at the end of the day and go home. You go home and write your papers. Um, so life seems very sim simple when you, when you look at scientists, um, but hopefully you can see that it's all worthwhile. Your path may not seem clear or straight, as I said, but, but hopefully your goals will endure. And you'll find that you have to make trade-offs and, and, and you have to be strategic um, at every step of your career. Um, so here's some, some paths that I took. Um, I started out working in a kind of quality assurance unit. I decided that wasn't really for me. Very early in the piece, I decided that because I was very interested in population health and I wanted to do something that was population-based um, and would be enduring but might also set us up in the years to come for, for research purposes, I was able to set up the statewide infant hearing screening program and set it up as a centralised program unlike any other state with capacity for consent going forward. And that's now become the basis of the way we're going to be able to implement our Generation Victoria study 25 years later. I didn't know that at the time, but um, it, that, that, that sense of something statewide with consent being set up always for research was the strategic choice that we made. I became involved in the longitudinal study of Australian children um, because it enabled me to build national networks, even though my first love, um, and it still is, was randomised trials. So I spent the next um, 15 years or so running multiple randomised trials really with the view that if you do randomised trials, you're really figuring out how to make a difference and you're doing something that can be translated and put into care. So I was focusing on trials in obesity, in language and learning, in hearing, in mental health and sleep um, disorders. And I just want to share one uh, result with you. This is from one of our studies, Let's Learn Language, um, where we were interested in slow to talk toddlers. So if toddlers don't start to talk, that's one thing that really, really worries their parents. Everyone else is talking, my kid isn't, what's wrong? So it's a real opportunity um, to um, undertake some promotion and see if you can make it make a difference. So, so we did the study, Let's Learn Language, and we recruited toddlers and um, these were their, their mean results. So a mean um, for the population is 100, and that, that result of, of average 77, 76 is about one and a half standard deviations below the mean. So these are kids who are really not saying anything at all at 18 months. Here they are two years later, they've come a long way up towards that population norm of 100, and here they are at three years, they're back to normal. What an amazing intervention. The trouble is these were the controls. And they were exactly the same as the intervention group. And we did a number of trials like this. And what it really made us realize was that as developmental pediatricians, as GPs, we have such terrible tools for prediction, for precision prediction. Which kids do we need to target? And unless we know how to target the right kids, we can't deliver the right treatment, but also we can't do the right randomised trials because our trials are going to be doomed to be ineffective. And so at that point, after 15 years of randomised trials, I switched tacks and went back to life course research, building multiple biorepositories, adding biomarkers and um, physical assessments to the existing longitudinal studies, and finally moving on to our statewide GNV, all with a view of actually creating resources that could lead us back to intervention-based research that would make a difference. So you will need to learn to make big things simple. As a clinician and scientist, you don't have much time, and your time is really valuable, and your time has to count. So you have to learn how to think big, 
talk big, but also keep it simple, both in how you talk about it to create that vision, but also how you do it, because you can't do it if it's not very simple. So with Gen V, this is um, a, a statewide project that we're planning at the moment. It does have a very big vision. It's that by 2035, we will have helped or started to help solve some of those complex issues that are facing our children and our adults now and tomorrow. So it's a, a big vision and we're really wanting to create a really exciting resource that can answer pressing questions. And we're really wanting to bring all of these things in genes, biology, adversity, social system services, how they together shape a life path. And very importantly, how we can change that. And that brings you back to that intervention thinking. And this is something that hasn't been done before for kids. It's been done for older adults, UK Biobank, um, Lifelines in the Netherlands. It hasn't been done for kids. Our kids are missing out. So that's kind of the big vision. But you also need to be able to keep it very, very simple. And so at its heart, what is Gen V? Well, it's a whole of Victoria cohort. It's targeting all babies born over two years. And it's four things. It's consent. It's biosamples that are already collected. It's linked data. And it's Gen V collected data that we're keeping very simple. So you start to see how you need to sort of focus on that simplicity to be able to bring um, something about and make it happen. And as you go, um, again, you know, for me, I, I came to research quite late. I was, I was always going to be a 100% um, clinician until I was in my th mid-30s and actually started having kids. So I really didn't start until I was 40, so you don't have much time. So when you come up to these, uh, these, the, these blocks and these barriers and these issues, you find that you have to solve them along the way because otherwise you can't keep going and you've got to do it within that very limited time. So as we think about Gen V, this big project, it's a bit daunting that we're trying to do, going from biology to society right across the lifetime, from molecular to phenome to society. One of the blocks that we really realised, the thing that was going to make it really, really difficult to do this was, well, yes, we need to know how the exposome um, shapes the phenome, your individual characteristics, and how it shapes society. But the thing that we can't do at scale yet is actually measure phenome. Um, so the combination of characteristics that makes you, you, whether you're tall, whether you're short, curly hair, blue eyes, good executive functioning, whatever, how do you take that from a study of 2,000 to a study of 150,000? So that's something that we're trying to solve at the moment in a very quick and um, and practical way because without phenomes we can't take genomes to the population level, we can't take artificial intelligence to, to the population level. I was at an AI conference recently where it was generally recognised um, by these top artificial intelligence people that the thing that's holding us back is we have the technology, we have the algorithms. What we don't have is very large richly phenotyped cohorts. And this is what we need. So it is actually it's something that we realise as we plan Gen V that actually this is something that is needed for Gen V, but also well beyond. And also if we want to do the sorts of trials, um, large N trials that might have a small individual effect, but actually a very large population effect, then we need endpoints and we need endpoints for lots of kids. So we're working at the moment on, okay, how can we digitally collect kind of this developing map in a way that's very low burden and stitch it together? And we're quite excited about this idea um, of the e-phenome and its capacity to bring in direct assessment and videos and images that actually might address all of these things. So, so you find yourself kind of solving these issues as you go because that's what gets thrown up and if you can't solve it quickly, you can't do what you want to do. <laughs> Now, what, what you will also, I don't know how inspirational you all feel sitting there in the audience, but what you find, I think, as you go, that, that actually you become the inspiration. You, you can inspire people as you go forward um, just through what you do and how you create their career. And as a clinician scientist, I think that's especially important. I think it's partly because you guys hopefully can see yourselves in people like me. You can see that we were like you, that we kind of understand um, where you're coming from. And what you will also find as you go ahead, not only can you inspire people, but, but you'll find that you are creating opportunities that they can own because that's the way that, 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 that big visions um, are created in the future.
And I think for me that's actually been one of the very, very most satisfying parts of being a clinician scientist, having that continual interaction and that joy of working with younger people, whether it's students, whether it's PhDs, whether it's postdocs. Um, so in our child health checkpoint um, study, which is one of the ones I flashed up, we had 60 students came and worked with us. And it was fantastic and they all found a place. Many of them published papers and many of them are now coming back to say, can, can, we, can we work in Gen B with you? Um, which for me is just incredibly exciting. So here is some of those uh, young people um, who have joined us in that particular project um, and they're all doing different things now. This is Jake, he's a medical student. This is Prue, she did our food stop. Jen is now um, doing facial trauma. Jake's a sports scientist, uh, neuropsychologist. Not sure what Anita's doing actually. And Richard is now a JMO and just got married at the weekend. And what you really, I think, learn to do is to, as I said, give people those opportunities to think for themselves and grow for themselves, hopefully within the space that you can create. Because again, you don't have much time, you can't do it yourself. It's all about creating that space for others to find their own vision. And I think lastly, just my last point is that um, for me looking back, so this was a great opportunity for me to look back a little bit and just think about you know, what, what have I valued uh, most of all and it really is about the, the kind of enduring home um, that um, has really happened for me through my life in research. Um, this is me just before I started my MD, kind of coming out of the 80s. <laughs> um, and moving on to the, the uh, child health checkpoint and then working with just wonderful people from lots of different clinical disciplines. So econ I think up there that's economics, developmental paediatrics and psychology and neuropsychology. Um, the, these lasting relationships, as you can see, we're all getting older together and still working together, branching out but still coming together around our, our common um, interests. We have fun. Um, and. Uh, a great joy has been in, I think, watching my supervisor becoming my mentor and then both of us watching my students um, themselves um, start to achieve and watching my students uh, far surpassing me in terms of their own abilities as clinician scientists and, and co-supervising um, with me. Watching my staff and uh, my younger clinician scientists get married, get pregnant, have babies, we've shared losses together amongst our younger staff. It, it really is a, a very enduring um, and lasting community that you build around yourself, I think, in the research world. And I think that happens in the clinical world as well, but there's a much higher turnover, um, I think, in that clinical world and that research world. Having that as well um, just brings an extra richness, depth and um, continuity, I think. So, um, I really do think that being a clinician scientist is something that keeps you very, very grounded, very, very practical. You have that sense of reality, as I said, you have that ability. You know, I can, I can go and talk to a family that I'm seeing for an emergency room follow-up and say, oh, by the way, what do you call your doctor? Do you call him your doctor or do you call him your GP or do you call him your family doctor? What do we need to put in our questionnaire? Or I can ask them about the hearing screening program and say, do you remember having a hearing screen? And if, I, if they say yes, I can say, were they nice to you? you and so you just get this intelligence on the ground um, through talking with, um, with your patients um, that, 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 that is incredibly humbling, grounding and enriching. So it does help you to keep your feet on your ground, but they're also inspiring and that's what I think helps you keep your eyes on the stars. So thank you very much.